All right, thank you very much. Okay, then, without any further ado, um, the first speaker for tonight is, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Marie Siegel from the uh, Primate Research Institute at Kyoto University. Um, she's a postdoc uh, working on the wildlife trade. Uh, and the title of her talk is The Anaconda in the Living Room, What's Wrong with the Exotic Pet Trade? Um, yeah, please enjoy, take it away. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna start sharing uh, my screen. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, go ahead yeah. and share your screen. I'm sorry. Um, first time here for an um, online session, so I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit a newbie here. So, um, okay. Okay, so thanks everybody for um, attending that talk. Just to give you a little bit more background about myself. So I'm a veterinarian and I'm a behavioral ecologist and I work on several wildlife species, including slow loris. It's actually the slow loris that made me talk about this subject tonight because slow loris are, um, are um, facing many threats. And one of them is to be, because they are being poached, retrieved from the natural habitat to be sell in the exotic pet trade. So this is what triggered my interest into that topic. And this is what I'm gonna, why I'm gonna talk about it today and try to explain you what is wrong with it. So first thing first, um, exotic pet trade is actually part of a wider phenomenon uh, that is called the wildlife trade. Wildlife trade is a multi-billionaire industry where products derived from non-domesticated plants or animals are sold are sold to, to finish in your, in your living room, basically. And this can be alive or dead specimens, such as furniture made of rosewood or fur coat or any, any decoration made of, like, made of uh, elephant ivory, like those statues, or even a cactus. And exotic pets are part of that big phenomenon. So exotic pets, such as parrots, turtles, frogs, snake, or many other kinds of species. Briefly, what is an exotic pet? Um, it's simply a species, that, uh, an animal that belongs to a species that has not been domesticated. So to take a very easy example, um, but dog being a domesticated species and the wolf being his uh, wild, wild ancestor, it's actually very different. I mean, um, you can tame a wild animal to get it accustomed to, long, to live alongside humans, but it will never be the same as with a domesticated species that has been selected uh, to, to tolerate humans, for example, or that has been selected to be a nice pet like dogs. For example, dogs are more tractable, more trainable, they are more submissive, and they are more tolerant to humans. So, this is just a, a quick example or different uh, domesticated, non-domesticated species are. So to go back to the exotic pet train, it's a phenomenon that is increasing in numbers, meaning that more and more individuals enter the, 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 the trade to be sell as pets, and it's millions of individuals every year, but it's also increasing in diversity. It means that there is more and more species that are offered to be traded, and it's, it's thousands of species. To give you an example, um, uh, about 800,000 American households own a pet snake, and Japan imported over 260,000 live birds within a decade. So it's a, it's a very large phenomenon. We could ask the question why um, people are looking for exotic pets. So I'm going to share my own guess with you guys tonight. And the first one I think of is cuteness. For sure, some species are selected because they are considered as cute. This is the case for the slow loris, but for many other species like potters, sugar gliders, cat gecko, or even sloths. Some people are more interested in excitement. 
I bet it must be exciting to have a bison in your living room, or a tiger, or an anaconda in your living room, or even a cheetah, or even a black mamba. Some people are more into rarity or strangeness, and those people are gonna are gonna choose in um, pets such as radiated tortoise or or rare salamanders, or even tamandua. Tamandua being a, a species coming from South America. Now the question is, why does it matter? Why do we care if people choose to have one of those exotic species in their living room? First, it's a matter of safety. Most of these animals have very specific requirement and it's actually our job to keep them in general and to keep them at home especially. And there is numerous accidents with it. Numbers of animals, exotic pets, actually kill their owners. So this is two very graphic examples, but I have gathered a couple of other examples for you, like horrific pet chimp attack on a woman, or a python strangling a toddler, or many other examples, and even a cassowary killing his own owner. So it's not only deadly accident, it's only incidents, for example, from escaped exotic pet. And it's so important in some countries that there is even a search engine about it. Like for example, Born Free has developed this, this engine where you can look for a specific accident based on species and stuff. So it's, it's an, import, an important problem. Second thing is the impact on biodiversity. When you get a dog, a, a pup or anything like that, you most of the time go to a pet shop, a breeding facility, a shelter, or maybe some friend of yours is gonna give one to you. But when you wanna acquire one of those individuals, how do you do it? Where, where do you get them? And more importantly, where are they coming from? So, like for dogs, they can come from breeding facilities. You can acquire them on pet shops, online shops, or more or less legal markets. But there are also a large proportion of those individuals that are actually wild caught, put directly in the pet shop, or this is the tricky part. It's when they are wild caught and put in a breeding facility. So it could be a long time ago and then you get you get uh, animals that are truly captive bred, meaning that their parents were captive bred, their grandparents were captive bred. So at the end, you have an individual that is truly captive bred. But it could also mean that you capture a pregnant female in the wild and put her to a breeding facility. And once she gets their, her babies, the babies are called wrenched. So their mother is well caught, but themselves are kind of wrenched. And you have the worst option where you actually capture individuals in the wild, put them in the breeding facilities, and the breeding facilities launder them, telling it's wild caught, um, telling them it's captive brand while it's wild caught. So I wanted to illustrate this with, um, with the example of the most popular pet snake in the trade currently, which is the ball python. And the ball python is actually very easy to buy. This is two different ads, one from a French online shop and another one from a, an American one. So you can buy online about Python very easily. And if you look closely at the ad, there is no mention of where these individuals are coming from. And to go further on that topic, I would like to use the work of a very interesting research team that got published in National Geographic recently, and that they, they, uh, they studied the this ball python trade and they showed that uh, within five years over 600,000 ball python were exported from those three countries only and those three countries lies precisely within the range of the ball python so it's actually hard to know from those individuals being exported the true proportion of captive bred for real ranged or wild caught so it's just to illustrate that you actually never sure where, the, where these animals are coming from. And this leads me to the first impact on biodiversity 
overexploitation when a large proportion of exotic pests is directly collected in the wild. And there is many examples where the, the, the trade was not sustainable and led to the, the decline of the white population. One of these examples is the gray parrot. It has been heavily traded with over 2 million individuals entering the trade. This led to a ban of international trade in 2015, but now the species in the wild is endangered. It's the same for the radiated tortoise, which is endemic to Madagascar, was banned from international trade early in 1975, but still white population declined due to illegal trade, and it's now cr critically endangered. And sometimes it's so huge that we call it a crisis. That's the case of the Asian songbird crisis that is fueled by the demand for cage birds and concerns hundreds of species such as the Javan sparrow, almost instinct in the wild due to wild, due to overtrapping and illegal trade, black wing mina, common eel mina, and also the Bali starling that actually went extinct in the wild. So it's, it can be a very strong impact. But you could tell me, okay, but I know very good breeding facilities. I'm 100% sure everything is bred, it's captive bred. There is no problem with that. So I'm, I'm all good for the impact on biodiversity. And I will, end, I will tell you, really? Let's talk about invasive species. Invasive species are any non-native species that significantly modifies or disrupts the ecosystem it colonizes. And it's a major biodiversity threat. So I'm gonna, to illustrate that, I'm gonna take the red earth slider, very popular pet turtle in the 80s, 90s. I think you have all seen it, it's very recognizable. And it was, it's a native from the east coast of the US. And in the late 80s or 90s, it was heavily exported, over 50 million individuals. And if you know the species a little bit, it's very cute and very small to start with, but it's growing fast. And he has a life expectancy that is over 20 years and that can even reach 40 years. So it's a long-term commitment. So for, so for many people, it's, it's not something they can do. So there is lots, lots of release in the wild, which is actually not their native uh, habitat, that leads to the establishment of many population. It's actually now established worldwide. This is all the little, um, uh, red square and are the established population and it's now labeled on one of the world's worst invasive species leading to a ban in the European Union and in Japan as well and it's because it has many impacts and one of the most important is the impacts on native fresh turtle so this is a very strong example but there is many more green colored uh, green colored pirates um, established worldwide the gray squirrel uh, competing with the native squirrel, Burmese python being um, a, a dramatic in, um, impact on uh, in the Everglades, and all coming from the pet trade. And there are many more potential invaders we don't know about yet. Another important impact is the sanitary risk. I think you have all heard about the emergence of coronavirus and it's linked to the wildlife trade and potentially the role played by pangolin. It's a bit the same with the exotic animals, uh, exotic animal pets, because they might carry numerous virus, bacteria, fungus, or parasites that could provoke a minor to a, to a very deadly disease to you. All those pictures come from disease that you can catch from exotic pets eventually. And there are many more. This is just a word cloud of all the species we know about, and this is not all of them. But there is also all the ones we don't know about yet. And there is a lot of research ongoing about this topic. People looking for new disease we could catch from snakes, tor pet tortoise, uh, birds, but also sugar gliders and many more. And I wanted to attract your attention, especially on that one. This little guy is a cancajou. It's a species that is coming from South America. 
very popular in the pet trade, especially in Japan right now. And recently, a Japanese research team discovered a new species of nematode, a new species of Balisascaris, actually, in a pet kankajin in Japan. And that Balisascaris was very closely related to a very deadly one. So we don't know yet if this could be passed on to humans and provoke disease, but this is concerning. Uh, Mari, I have a quick question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, could you explain uh, what a nematode is exactly? Uh, it's a it's an intestinal uh, it's an intestinal worm you could get and that can eventually travel uh, everywhere like echinococcus for example you can get it if you uh, have a contact with contaminated feces and it can end up in your brain. Thank so, you. Oh, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the last thing the last thing we should be that should be important for us as well is about is animal welfare. Because when you get an exotic pet, most of them have very specific requirements. Like if you take the sloth example, on the left panel, this is what you're gonna offer to them at, at best. And on the right panel, this is what they normally do, what they normally have access to. And it's the same for many species Great pirates, for example, they're very social animals. They normally live in large flocks. Well, all you could offer to them is to chain them to a cage with very little contact with their own kinds. And of course, being a slow loris biologist, I have to talk about that guy. And slow loris is nocturnal primates. It mainly lives in the canopy. It's mainly gum and, and insects. And if you have that guy in your living room, you could only expose him to, to broad light and offer him some cat food or so, which is gonna lead to health issue, obviously. So it's, it's, it's truly heartbreaking. But there is also what's happening before. This is the face of wildlife trade. This is hundreds of pirates spied in the little cage. This is the face of wildlife trade, tons of turtles. Once again, this is the face of wildlife trade. And I have to talk about slow loris again. I mean, slow loris are very hard to reproduce in captivity. So almost 100% sure if you end up with a slow loris in your living room, it has been through this process, piling up in a cage, a large portion of them dying, and some people even cut their teeth because slow loris are venomous to make sure they won't bite you. So this is the sad truth be, uh, behind the wildlife trade. I also wanted to attract your attention on the role of social media because putting um, cute videos of, uh, of yourself with an um, with exotic pet is actually very popular. This is a um, few examples I've gathered on the web with like from that couple with a pet cancajou, almost a 200,000 view. This guy telling you to have a pet snake, almost 500,000 view. A leopard gecko eating a trait, over 1 million views. And this guy washing an otter in the bathroom sink, over 27 million view. So it's huge. And I have to talk about the anaconda in the living room, almost 9 million views. And of course, the slow are sitting a rice ball over 30 million views. So it's all of this is actually promoting having an exotic pet, and he has he has bad consequences. I'm going to use the words of um, National Geographic that made a, a nice paper on that um, recently, with just that: don't be fooled by social media. Wild animals make terrible pets. Plus you're gonna promote all the things I've just described to you. And in my opinion, anything trivializing owning an exotic pet should be avoided. And I just wanted to briefly discuss the case of Exotic Animal Cafe. It's a, a white phenomenon. I mean, it's a phenomenon that is getting more and more important here in Japan, but in other countries as well. Most of you have probably heard about the Howl Cafe, but it's not only this, it's also 
many other species like penguins, reptiles, otters, actually hundreds of species. And this is part of the same phenomenon. And once again, in my opinion, should be avoided. So my take home message on this talk is that exotic pets are bad news for people's safety and health, biodiversity and animal welfare, obviously. You should never release an exotic pet in the wild. Even after my talk, if you realize, oh my goodness, I have an exotic pet, what should I do? Don't put it in the wild, okay? Um, and I believe strongly that promoting exotic pets via social media should be avoided. So, this is about it, about what I wanted to tell you about the exotic pet. But I just want to replace that in, that in its broader context. I told you at the beginning that the exotic pet is only a small portion of what wildlife trade is. And wildlife trade concerns thousands of species, including plants. And maybe in another nerd night session, I could talk about what's wrong with the wild plant trade and taking maybe the cactus example. So yeah, that's uh, all I wanted to tell you today. So I'm, I'm ready for any, any question. Okay, thank you so much, Marie. Uh, that's a great, uh, great talk and a fun topic. We're going to have to actually have to get you back for the uh, cactus <laughs> in the living room because while we've seen, you know, uh, owl cafes out there, I don't think there's a lot of uh, cactus petting uh, cafes out there. So it might not be as a, actually a familiar topic to mm -hmm. some, uh, some people. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Um, if you will go into Q&A, so if you could uh, like unshare uh, your screen and um, so now uh, we're going to go and take questions from our audience for about 10 minutes. Uh, okay. People who have any questions, we'll start with the people in the Zoom call right now. Uh, people in the Zoom call, if you have questions, you're welcome to type them in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. After that, we will go into the a YouTube chat. So anybody on the YouTube chat, please go ahead and type, as what Katie has written, go ahead and type your question in there and we'll ask it here. All right, uh, the floor is open. Okay, so Kenneth has Kenneth, one question. Please, Kenneth, if you can ask. Hello, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I had a question. I think it was very interesting to mention the difference between uh, domestic species against wild species and the fact that it's not the same at all. But I think I've noticed in social media more and more the uh, like the a growing arguments of people in favor of owning wild animals saying that cats and dogs, for instance, also come from wild species and they've been selected. So why shouldn't we now st start to domesticate otters or tigers or wild cats or anaconda? What would you say uh, in this regard? Uh, it's a tricky question. I, I could uh, there is two things to me. First will be why? Why do we need more pets? I mean, there is already a good selection of things. I mean, there is over 300 bred of, of dogs. So already, I think it's like 290 breads of dogs and 50 of cats. So I think the, the choices there, the options are, are present. The second thing is that domestication is a long process. So if you believe, I mean, you, you will start a dom, I mean, it's not, it's not you can process domestication. It's, I'm sorry, I'm being a bit confused there, but it's, um, it's not that simple. And it's not, we can, we can start, it's not, it's for some reason that we only have a couple of species that have been domesticated truly. Some species make good pet materials like wolf, because they have to start with good communication skills. You know, for, for being a pet, it's important. So I don't really know where you're gonna end up with a turtle, what, what it's gonna bring to you. It's also a question of what are you expecting from a pet? So it's, it, I find it a hard question to answer. 
the uh, in, in adding to that, the entire process of having to domesticate an entire species is not as simple as a couple of generations breed bred in captivity, I take it. You'd have to like select the docile, the more, the yeah. ones more um, amicable to, uh, to human interactions. But once again, it depends on what you're looking for. Some people just want to have a black mamba in in a little box so they are not really interested in domestication i believe so but yeah you're right it's a long process yeah if i may i think i've heard the la latest estimation for dogs domestication ranges between 10 and forty thousand years process mm -hmm. which is probably a long time to hope reaching domestication for social media i guess <laughs> we got to get started now, don't we? <laughs> the first domesticated python coming to you in 20,040. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've got one question from the YouTube. Uh, Matt is asking that apart from avoiding the things that you mentioned, like ex exotic uh, cafes and things like that, what would be the ways to reduce these issues, do you think, Marie? Like, are there any charities that focus on it, for example? Yes. Um, yes, they are. You can, first, you can um, support uh, charities or that are um, invested in protecting species uh, in the wild. For example, there is some on slow loris, there is some on, on, uh, on radiated tortoise, all those species that are impacted by the, the wildlife trade. So I think that could be a, a good way to start. And also, even around you, uh, if you have friends that are talking about like, oh, this is cute, I could get an otter. Maybe just around you, you can spread the words and try to explain why you don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, thank you, I agree. It's definitely, it's difficult, right? Because everybody loves those cute, pet videos I think sort of being that person in the corner saying ah, actually this is not such a good thing it's quite a difficult thing to do even though I definitely agree with you yeah and you can on the social media you can also unlike and mm. there is a depending on the videos but there is a button you can press if you believe it's animal abuse mm. because lots of them are actually so you can still try to report but I won't lie it's a uh, we do that to the slow lorries, but we are overwhelmed with the people actually like it. Right, right, right. Oh, thank you. Hi, Mahi. So I have a question because you said that people that know that they have uh, illegal uh, animals, they shouldn't release. So what would be the indication for that? Like, what should they do if they are willing to um, give it back let's say there is several options i think uh, there is many shelters that will uh, accept those individuals most of them cannot go back in the wild don't believe that you will be able to put them in the wild because in the first place you don't know where they're coming from so it's going to be a long and costly process so for me those individuals are doomed uh, they won't participate to the survival of their species but giving them to a shelter, trying, because there is so many species, it's actually hard to know, but you have to get some information and also you can still, yeah, you know, that give them to shelters or places that have good, good uh, equipment will be always better than in your living room. That's, that will be my answer. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned how social media uh, impacts uh, the wildlife trade and, uh, and people wanting to, uh, you know, own, own exotic animals. Uh, there's obviously been uh, cases like times before social media where, you know, there was a boom in exotic animals. Uh, are there any are there any like films or shows on like television that you could point to that may have like directly directly or indirectly caused uh like a boom in some kind in an exotic in the consumption of a specific kind of exotic pet 
It's been discussed. Uh, some uh, researchers think, for example, that Harry Potter movies have been uh, promoting the keeping owls as pets. Uh, there is also some uh, some belief that maybe finding Nemo has been uh, having uh, an influence on uh, keeping clown uh, fish. So there is a couple of examples that are uh, that are pinpoint yes. We have any more questions from the uh, audience? Oh, we got something from uh, the YouTube. Mm, yeah, so Victoria just asked, so are there any laws or rules for exotic pet trade in Japan, especially keeping and getting exotic pets? Yeah, so mm, she said she meant to miss the beginning of the talk. So I think maybe you mentioned a little bit, but yeah, if you could go. Over yeah, that it's, uh, I didn't go into details that much mm. because it varies strongly between the countries, but Japan has, it's kind of a trick in Japan because uh, there is a ban or international ban of importing specific uh, species in Japan. For example, many primates are banned from importing for infectious uh, risks. Mm. But once the animals are in Japan, it's actually the, the legislation is not strong. And um, so basically you can almost own everything in Japan even though if even if the animal has been poached actually even if it has been smuggled in japan and you see that in the some of the the exotic pets some for example are displaying slow lorries and slow lorries are banned from international trade so where are they coming from there is no captive breeding facilities in japan in a, for a slow loris apart from a, one species but it's very expensive and they only have few births every year so the species you could see in some of those cafes are a species there is no captive, no breeding facilities. So they are for sure smuggled. But still, once you have them, once the smuggle is being successful, there is nothing that prevents you from keeping it. So it's a, it's a bit tricky. In other countries, you could have like in France, there is a list of species, you, especially dangerous species, um, Japan has a bit as that for dangerous species, but apart from tigers and big stuff like that. In France, there is many species you cannot have unless you have some kind of a qualification. But those countries are very rare. In the US, for example, I don't think there is anything about you. Uh, you can have a tiger, it's no problem. Mm. Okay. I think when uh, Tiger King st uh, started, there was a bunch of articles talking about the exotic pet trade, and one of the surprising statistics was there's more there are more tigers in captivity in the u.s and there are actually in nature globally which yeah which is absolutely horrifying because mm -hmm. then it's like oh the the people like the i forgot what the guy's name is they're the those are the kinds of people who have all the all these uh, exotic animals and, and tigers specifically mm -hmm. Uh, actually, I have a I have a question. Um, there's, I don't know if you know. There's a fairly famous Instagram account, uh, Juniper Fox, is a fox, and she oh. says that uh, like her foxes are rescued from fur farms, and she has some other animals as well. There's, I know she has a sugar glider. I don't know if that's from a shop or uh, rescued. And she sort of she makes very cute videos about them, but she's also very careful about saying you know, these are from fur farms, you should not get a fox because they're very difficult to look after. And there's a lot of, like in the comments, there's a lot of uh, discussion about, you know, whether that's okay or not. So yeah, I'm interested in your opinion in that kind of situation where they're kind of rescued from a farm or something like this. I, it's tricky because you have to find those individuals at home. And um, it's maybe, I don't, I don't know that person, maybe she's doing great work, but there is always that possibility when you promote it on social media, you, people are going to get the wrong right. message. And especially if you promote it in a cute way. I mean, you can promote your action in some way that will be less likely to, to, to make people willing to have a fox. So I think it's also a question on how you promote your action. And I'll say, not knowing the background and stuff, but too much cuteness is not what you're looking for. Mm. 
Right, right, right. It's kind of like she's kind of saying one thing but doing another. Doesn't quite match that one. Yeah, and mm. there is lots of um, lots of people. I, I don't know about that person once again, but lots of people are actually using that argument while some sometimes it's not even true. So because it's right. making them look like the good guy. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I, I'm looking at their Instagram right it's now. Very it's very cute. Like <laughs> five days ago, they had a thing like why don't you want to have a fox as a pet and it is yeah. not helping its cause <laughs> it's like it's all it's just it's cute well-produced uh shots here it doesn't help it's tricky exactly. they do they do talk a lot about uh you know how the how the fox like pisses all over the house and eats all of their stuff and they they, they do make a big point of like you shouldn't do it but they still upload all this content so yeah i'm not quite sure what the mm. what, what they're trying to achieve i guess by posting all of that yeah. They probably don't know themselves. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right, and that's a good place uh, for time. Uh, any kind of other lingering questions people might have? Oh, there's, hold on, I've, there are a couple of things in the chat here. Oh, okay, this is Vanessa's, uh, Vanessa's reading out something in the chat that we'll uh, put, we'll try to put on as well. Um, Katie, can you see if you can put those links up on, uh, are you the YouTube chat as well later? Am I? Okay. Uh, all right. Any, yeah, so any kind of lingering questions, uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, type him in the chat. We'll ask him uh, later on after all of the speakers, if there are any. Um, and so for now, we will take a five, another five minute break and uh, we'll reconvene here uh, after that. So please go refresh your drinks. Um, I'm trying to stall for time while I try to set this timer here. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, we'll, and we'll be right back. <laughs>